Well, good morning. What a great Sunday it is to be worshiping Jesus live and direct virtually. Man, I don't know what y'all are doing. I don't know where y'all are, but uh, the church is literally at your house wherever you are. The altar is literally at your house wherever you are. We can worship Jesus wherever. And that's one of the things I love most about Christianity is that we, we don't have to be confined to one specific location or one specific building, but wherever we are, we can worship Jesus because our meeting place is Jesus. He gives us full access into the throne of our God. Well, it's Psalm 100 verse 2 that says it best. It says, worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful song. I am so grateful to be able to worship Jesus virtually through song and shout out to the worship team. Shout out to uh, Josh, who leads our worship team, and, and Chris Lilly, uh, who, who uh, led us today, and uh, also Rob. Just grateful for everyone that puts their hands to the plow to serve Jesus in the way of uh, worship music. I'm also equally excited about preaching because that is my responsibility every week. And so do me a favor, grab your, your physical copies or your devices or your laptops or iPads, Whatever it is that has the Word of God for you, contains the Word of God, grab it and get to the last book of the Bible. We're going to be in Revelation today. Y'all do me a favor. Y'all take that S off Revelation. It's not Revelations. It's Revelation. Go to the book of Revelation and go to chapter 4. That's where we're going to spend our time. We're continuing on in our sermon series called Rigged, uh, where we're looking at um, what it looks like to see the election rigged for Jesus Christ every time. I, I typically don't endorse candidates, uh, but I'll endorse Jesus every single time because he wins every single election, no matter who actually is on the ballot. Uh, but I, I should take a quick moment and just slow down for a second and encourage you to vote. I don't know if you've registered. I think we already hit the deadline. So if you have not registered, I think it's too late to register. However, if you have registered, please make sure that you vote. Uh, you actually do not have to wait till November 3rd to vote. In fact, I've already requested my ballot, and so next week I should have my ballot. I talked to some of you earlier this week, and you have already started voting. And so I just want to encourage us, you know, I, I, just, I think we can critique this country while participating in democracy to see change. And so I think both can happen at the same time, so it's important uh, that we do take it serious. You know, there's a lot more on the ballot than, than just the presidency. I mean, you, you have local judges are on that ballot. You, you, you have uh, senators are on that ballot, state representatives are on that ba ballot, uh, congresswomen and congressmen. And uh, as you can see, Supreme Court justices, uh, justices are on the ballot. And so uh, take a, a few moments to make sure that you get up and get out and, and make sure that you vote. For some reason, we think that Elections happen every four years. They actually happen every two years. And so uh, once you register to vote, you can just continue to vote. So uh, please, 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 please make sure that that is uh, front and center for you. Uh, also, really quickly, Gabe announced the reopening survey that went out. This, we're taking it very serious. Uh, the reopening survey doesn't mean that we are reopening right away. It, it just means we want to be responsible with how we um, how we communicate information to you, how we look at reopening and see what you guys are feeling. You know, that's one of the markers. We've always been watching what our state and local officials are saying about the pandemic. Uh, but we also want to hear from you. What are you feeling about the pandemic? Um, and so we, we want to make sure that we are looking at a date to reopen some way responsibly. We don't know how yet, but your survey is going to certainly help guide us toward, uh, toward a responsible way to do that. All right. I'm real excited to preach the word of God today. You should be there. I've uh, done a lot of small talk to get you there, but now you should be there in verse one. Revelation four, verse one says, after this, I looked and there in heaven was an open door. The voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this? Please note that those words are in red. If you got a good Bible, they're in red. Verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit. This is John, the apostle John talking. Immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne in heaven and someone was seated on it. And the one who was seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone and a rainbow that had a, the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in all white 
with golden crowns on their heads. You should make a note of the golden crowns on their head. Jump to verse 10 real quick. The 24 elders fell down before the one seated on the throne and worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne and say, O Lord, our God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. I want to preach today from the topic entitled an unimpeachable throne. Would you just type that in the chat room for me just in case someone pops in a little bit later on. Uh, Type that in so they know the direction of the sermon. An unimpeachable throne. Let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Uh, Father, we gather around your word like we do every week, completely dependent on you. We pray for your presence to be here. Uh, Lord, I I don't pray for an informational dump today. I don't don't think your people would benefit from just information. But Lord, I pray for a a, a transformative word. I, I pray for impact today. Pray that you would take this word, oh God, and soften the hearts of your people so that it penetrates Lord, I pray Jesus Christ will be proclaimed. I love the way the scriptures say it. Woe unto me if I preach not or proclaim not the gospel. So, Lord, I pray that Jesus would be front and center today as we talk about the election coming up, but also talk about the election that you always win, which is every election in every nation in this world. It's in Christ's name we give all glory. Amen. An unimpeachable throne. By the way, shout out to everybody that's chatting. I saw Dave in the chat room. I think Dave is uh, quarantined somewhere in London. Shout out to him, man. We miss you, brother. We, we deeply, deeply miss you. Uh, but man, y'all keep chatting, please, please. I'm, I'm watching the chat room go up. An unimpeachable throne. In this current season that we're in, many of us have been honestly over-consumed by the news as it surrounds this current election. What is the president tweeting? What is the Democratic nominee talking about? What is this, does the Speaker of the House have on a mask? I don't know if y'all saw last night I was watching the news and a state representative in Georgia literally was crowd surfing with no mask on. What is Dr. Fauci saying? We're, we're looking at the news constantly over and over again and I think... It doesn't matter your political persuasion, nor does it matter what your news channel of choice is. I think we can all agree that every single news channel has a bias bent toward it. It it, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you think. Every news channel always has a bias bent toward it. If you watch Fox News, it's because it, it has a more conservative lean to it. If you watch CNN News, it's because it has a more liberal lean to it. They all have a certain bias to it, but what is consistent with every news channel, no matter what the bias bent is, no matter what it is, every news channel, we can agree on this, they're all promoting human authority and earthly thrones. Every one of them. We are in the middle of an election right now to elect the most powerful man in the world, not just our nation, but the most powerful man in the world. And even though the U.S. is not a monarchy that uh, passed down throne after throne after throne, it's a, it, it's a democracy. E- even though we have a democracy as a nation, you have to understand something. The authority and the power of the presidency is extremely, extremely powerful. And as Christians, if we're not careful, we can confuse the power of the presidency with the power of the throne of Christ. If we are not careful, we can look at this election and think all of our chips are banked on whoever the nominee is and whoever actually wins the presidency. But in reality, I'm never worried because heaven is not deterred by American politics. Christ's throne is not worried right now with who will win the election. So I literally want to get us off of MSNBC. I want to get us off of Fox News. I want to get us off of CNN. And I want to get us on HNN. That's Heaven News Network today. Because I think we get a picture today in Revelation chapter 4 of the throne of Christ. And I'm literally today going to simply preach about that throne. Because I think if we can now change our perspective from looking at what is going on around us and look at what is going on above us, I think it gives us some solace. I think it helps us to relax. I think it helps us to understand that we serve a God that is completely sovereign the way our grandmother would say it is. We serve a God that's in 
control and nobody can shake that control from him. There's some words that I want you to pay attention to in verse one. In verse one, it says, after this, I looked and there in heaven was an open door. The voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. Look at the invitation. And I will show you what must take place after this. I'm not sure if you pick this up, but in verse one, there's two book end statements to verse one. The verse literally starts with after this. It ends with after this. Twice in that verse, the, the, the writer, which is John, he writes about something that's going to take place after this. Now, of course, ultimately, he is referring to after the seven letters to the seven churches. That was chapter two and chapter three. Just stay with me for context purposes. Chapter two and chapter three, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. And some of those letters are encouraging. And some of those letters are straight rebukes. He writes a letter to Ephesus and Samira and Pergama and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia. And finally, he has concluded the last letter to to Philadelphia. And, and now John is saying after this, and yes, he's pointing to after the letters, but I think there's something deeper going on in the text. He's saying after this, in terms of after this life, that there is something larger at play in what John is saying. In fact, he picked it up in John in Revelation 1, 1, when he said the revelation of Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, the things that must take place after this epiphany. I don't know how you feel, but this verse after this should encourage us because it reminds us, those of us who have trusted in Jesus, there is something that's going to happen after this. After what, Pastor B? After this life. After this pandemic, there is something that should be taking place. After this election, after the earthly injustice, after sickness, after death, there's a place that I can long for and there's a place that I can look forward to. And John just simply writes, he paraphrases the, uh, an eschatological view of what heaven will be like. And he'll just simply say, after this. I don't know about you, man, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the after this. For far too long, we've been living life for now. And many of us aren't living life for the after this. Whatever that after this is going to look like, we get a picture in Revelation 4, but many of us live life as though there is no after this. We stock up here on earth as though this is the final destination. But if you've trusted in Jesus, we're just passing through. If you was up in this room, I tell you, look at your neighbor and say, I'm just passing through. So would you just type that in for me? I'm just passing through because there is something that I am looking forward to. There is something that I am longing for. And the reason I'm longing for it is because it is eternity and my 70, 80, 90, 100 years on earth pales into comparison to the after this. I love the way James says it. In James chapter four, he, he, he simply says, what is your life? He says, what is your life? You are like a vapor or like a mist. Do you realize what a mist is? Do you realize how quickly a mist goes? For some reason, we think that we are here today and gone tomorrow, but the reality is you're here today and gone today. But that's how quick life is. In the bigger scheme of things, life is short. And so you have to be able to long for something after this. After this quick life, the Bible says that it's like a mist. Let me see if I can kind of illustrate a mist for you. My, I, I stole this. My wife is going to get at me about this. This is her, her plant bottle. I think she was spraying her hair last night with it too, so it's multi-purpose. So I figured I'd use it for the sermon. And he, here's what a mist looks like. When he says after this, he's saying your life is short. He's saying this is your life. That's it. Look how quickly that mist vanishes. And for some reason, we stock up and you buy Balenciagas in the MCM bag and God is looking at you going, that's your life though. That that's how quickly it goes. We, we go, oh man, my spiritual life, I'll get my spiritual life together one day. And God is like, one day, that, that's it. That's all you got in the bigger scheme of things. But for some reason, we live for now. And John is saying, look, there's something that happens after this, you should type that in one more time. After this, I am longing for something. I need to change my perspective of looking uh, uh, around me and start to look above me because there is something else that I'm living for. Many of us are living in the already, but not yet. Salvation already happened on the cross, 
but we are not yet in our final resting place. And so we are in that, in the tension of the already, but not yet. But I love John today because he writes these words after this long for something else. I love the way Paul says it in Philippians. He, he says to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm, I'm like, wait a second. You were literally saying it's better to die because he realizes that after this. In fact, he goes on in that same verse that is hard. I'm hard pressed between the two. He, he says, but my desire to depart and be with Christ is far better. Like I, I, I personally like, Lord, give me a few more days to be able to accomplish some things, but I too am longing to be with Christ because no, there is no sickness with Christ. There, there is no quarantine with Christ. There are no mask wearing with Christ. There is no social distancing in heaven. So I am longing for something that's greater than my current reality. And what does that point me to after this? When I get to sit and be in the glory of God and look at Jesus Christ sitting on the throne with a tat on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords in a position of power, I am looking forward to that. Again, I need some more days here, but I am looking forward to that. John, John gets an invitation. He gets a sneak peek into the throne room of God. In fact, when he gets this sneak peek, Jesus literally says in verse one, come up here. I'm going I'm to show you what's going to take place. And then he's zapped into heaven. And when he's zapped into heaven, the Bible says here in verse two, immediately I was in the spirit. Watch this. And there was, please underline this, a throne in heaven. And someone was seated on it. And the one who was seated had the appearance of Jasper and a carnelian stone, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Uh, John literally finds himself zapped into heaven, almost like getting a sneak peek, like a movie trailer. This is literally the command center of the galaxy. He is now zapped into that place. And when he gets there, he sees one specific focal point, a throne. He sees the throne of Christ and the throne is the central th theme of the book of Revelation. Don't get it twisted. If you read through all 22 chapters, 17 of the 22 chapters mention a throne. There are only five chapters that don't say anything about a throne. And in fact, I'll, I'll go deeper than that. Out of the 62 times that a throne is mentioned in the New Testament, 47 of those times, they are mentioned in the book of Revelation. That means 76% of the, of, of, the, of the New Testament, the throne is mentioned in the book of Revelation. It is the central focus of this book. And it's very important to remember that despite all that takes place on earth, despite the events, despite everything that you see, despite the corruption, there is a throne in heaven that is unshaken and cannot be overtaken. And I don't know about you, but that, that brings me joy. That, that brings me joy knowing that the place that I put all of my hope is everlasting. That the place that I bring all of my hope is unpeachable. Listen, you didn't vote Jesus in, and you can't vote him out. You can't stock the courts against him. Mitch McConnell and, and, and uh, Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi cannot put the house against him. You can't put laws against him. His throne is forever. It's unmovable. I was watching the Supreme Court nominee Amy Barrett this week as she was doing her uh, confirmation hearing with the committee, and the Judiciary Committee was sitting there and some of them were piping in for social distance reasoning, reasonings. And she's sitting there in one seat in the middle of the room. And they're all firing away, asking questions. This is one of the top judges in the country. She's sitting there as a judge being fired away and hammered away at all of these tough questions that some of them she was struggling to answer. And some of them she was dodging. And she's sitting there and she's in the hot seat. But when I read Revelation 4, I don't see Jesus in the hot seat. There is no committee that pushes against Jesus. That there is no there, there is no group of senators and a committee that can sit there and go, and what about this? And what about that? No, Jesus is in full control. When John gets there, he sees Jesus sitting on his throne chilling. Like like the like the biggie picture with his with his with his crown tilted to the side because he accomplished on earth exactly what he said he would, which was salvation for all of us. Jesus is undeterred and it gives me comfort. 
I love the way Colossians 1 says it. It it says, for by him all things were created on earth and in heaven, whether visible or invisible or thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. It says he's before all things and in him all things hold together. It shows you the amount of power and authority and rulership that Jesus has. And this is why I'm confident in this election, because I realize that ultimately Jesus is still on the ballot. I know what you're doing. You're going, I don't like either candidate. I get it. But there is a candidate that you should like, and he wins every election. And his name is Jesus Christ. So Jesus' throne, is, it, 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 it's established forever. You have to understand that every other government and every other throne is at best is a knockoff. At best. That there, do you look at the words that describe this throne? Jasper. That's diamonds. Cornelius stones and emeralds. It speaks to the perfection and the clarity and the beauty and the justice and the holiness of the throne of Christ. Everything else is average. Everything else is subpar, but John here points us to a reality that one day we will see this throne. And I love it because John's not the only one that pointed us to it. Ezekiel talked about it, Ezekiel 1. Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah chapter uh, 6. Stephen points us to it in Acts chapter 7. I love Acts chapter 7 because Stephen, the Bible says he's getting stoned and he gazes into heaven and he sees Jesus not sitting but standing by the throne. Because it is almost like like God is like, look, my babies is getting persecuted. I got to stand up. And he stands up and nevertheless, he is in the same place that John sees him in the throne room. But for some reason, we think that this is some fantasy. We, We don't think that this place actually really exists. But here's where my joy is that when I get to heaven, I'm going to see exactly what John sees in John chapter four, in Revelation four. Can you believe that? Like one day, you will see exactly what John sees in Revelation chapter 4. See, some of y'all going to be chilling at the pearly gates taking selfies. So the Bible says that, that the streets will be paved with gold. Some of y'all going to be having block parties on the street. And I ain't mad at you. Baby, do your thing. I, I get it. So the Bible says in John chapter 14, Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Some of y'all are going to be chilling at the crib. But if you want to find me, you look for me in the throne room because I'm going to be laid out before the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The greatest party in heaven is going to be in the throne room, which is what we see in John chapter in Revelation chapter four. Our king is seated on the throne and he has full authority. But John doesn't just see one throne. John sees 24 other thrones. Look at verse 4. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the throne sat 24 elders. Watch how they're dressed. Not with emerald, but just white clothes. With golden crowns on their head. Bible says in verse 10, the 24 elders fell down before the one seated on the throne. That means the main throne. And they worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. And they said, O Lord, our God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things. And by your will, they exist that were created. The Bible says here that when John gets up there, he sees a main throne, which is Christ sitting on his throne in a position of power. But then he sees 24 other thrones. And on these thrones are 24 elders. We, we don't know exactly who these elders are. Some say that they're, they're the saints of the Old Testament and New Testament. Some say they're the leaders of the tribe of Israel and uh, the 12 apostles. So some people say that they are simply angels. We, we don't know exactly who they are, but it doesn't matter. Here is what we know, that they're all positioned in positions or seats of power with crowns on their head. But when Jesus takes the throne, they pull down their authority. When Jesus sits on the throne, they take off their crowns and they lay them before the feet of Jesus Christ. And I love this because whatever authority and rewards you earn here for honoring Jesus You must, too, do the same thing these elders are doing when you get to heaven. There is nobody walking around going, look at my crown. I'm killing it in heaven. 
We all are taking off our crowns and we're putting them at the feet of Jesus. You do realize that on this earth, you do gain certain rewards and crowns. Let me put a little Bible here. James chapter one, verse 12 says it this way. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for whenever he has stood the test, he will receive. Here it is a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. First Peter chapter five, verse four says something similar. When the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Revelation chapter three, verse 11 says, I'm coming to you. Hold fast so that no one may seize your crown. Jesus promises various rewards and various crowns. But our immediate response to the beauty and splendor of Jesus in heaven must be the same response of the 24 elders. We get off of our rewards. We take off of our crowns and we put them at the feet of Jesus. Why should you be willing to lay down your crown for Jesus? Here it is because he laid down his crown for you. The reason why we are overwhelmed with the beauty and splendor of Christ is because Christ first modeled for us what it looks like to take off his crown to accomplish something. I love the way Philip says it. He says, Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. The reason I have no issues in heaven taking off my crown for Jesus Christ is because Jesus had no issue stepping off of his throne, taking off his crown to become a servant. And he did it for you. He did it because of the dysfunction of our sin. He did it because Adam and Eve messed up so bad that everybody born after them is now born inherently corrupt. He did it because he knew it was the only way that you and I can be reconciled to God. Do you understand that the throne has emeralds and jasper? It is holy. There is, it is not a place that you can approach if you have sin. So Jesus is like, I got to find a way for them to get up in this room with me. Oh, I know. I got to take off my crown, go to a cross, die so that they now have the ability to have full access to me. The reason why I am so excited about getting in heaven, the reason why I'm like, catch me at the throne is because Jesus has got out of the throne. What king you know did that? What king do you know stepped off this throne and took off his crown in order to accomplish the work of salvation? It is impossible for you to be saved if Jesus does not get off that throne temporarily while he steps into human life and breathes air that he created. Did you hear me when I read Colossians 1? That he created all things and without him nothing was made. Go to a cross and get on wood that he created. Be slapped by hands that he created. I'll go deeper. Come through the birth canal of a woman that he created. Do you realize that even Mary was created by Christ. And Jesus does all of this because he knows that it's the only way for you to be able to enjoy this party in Revelation 4. He he does all this because he understands that this is the only way that you and I will be reconciled back to the Father. I I know that's a big word, but that, that simply means that Jesus purchased the right for you to have a relationship with God. You know, many of us, as I start to end my time here, many of us I think we think we've earned the right to be in this party. You ever stand outside of a club and you waiting to get in and you know somebody, so they let, they let you in. That's not how it works. Actually, that is how it works. You got to know one person. His name is Jesus. He, you literally get to the, to the gate and the bouncers are there and you're just like, yo, Jesus uh, already did this for me. And so therefore, I have full access to the party. And Jesus is like, man, come on in, man. Walk through them streets of gold. Walk past that pearly gate. The party is in the throne room. Here is why I'm not worried about earthly thrones. I'm not worried about earthly power. Listen, I don't care what corrupt government, I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because there is a government that is unimpeachable and it's the government of Christ. I don't know who I'm talking to, but man, there's somebody that's looking at the wrong throne. You fixed your gaze on the thrones of earth. You've looked at local officials and you, you've looked at the ballot and you're like, man, I'm gonna I'm just stay home. But you, you are so depressed by what you see when it comes to earthly power, but I'm still encouraged because I read places like Revelation 4. This is an eschatological view. 
of, of, the, of, of the one place, the command center of all the galaxies. The earth rotates around the sun because Jesus is sitting on his throne. Do you realize if Jesus stopped being Jesus for five minutes, everything melts? That's how dope he is. If Jesus steps off his throne and stops being who he is, the Bible says that all things were created through him and for him and in him all things not held together but hold together. He's holding you together. He's holding the galaxy together. And he's through, doing it through this one place, Revelation 4. You need to change your perspective today. I don't know where, where the musicians are. Let's play something soft. You need to change your perspective today because somebody in here is just, you're looking at the wrong place. And because you're looking at the wrong place, it has you full of anxiety. Because you're looking at the wrong party, it has you full of anxiety. My hope and my, my, my dreams aren't set on the Democratic or the Republican Party. It's set on the party that's happening in Revelation 4. Oh, I want to join the elders. I want to be like the elders, man. I want to take off my crown and worship Jesus. And I don't know who you are today, but that needs to give you hope. That needs to give you joy. That, that needs to fulfill you. That void you feel is, is, is actually fulfilled in Revelation 4. When we get with Jesus. Some people think like, you know, heaven's going to be boring. We're not like, what are we going to do? Are we going to know people? Like we ask all these questions. Here's what you should be asking. How do I get to the throne? Where's that room at? Because that, that's the room I want to be in. Do you realize that Revelation 21 will say that there will be no sun in heaven because Jesus is the light of heaven? He literally sitting on the throne giving out the light that will illuminate heaven. Man, I, I'm, so, I'm so pumped to be there. I can't explain how pumped I am to be there. Father, I pray, oh God, for that one person that is looking at the wrong place. That's, that person that is full of anxiety and full of fear and full of worry because they're watching the news. They're looking at their Instagram feed and they're seeing things that disturb them. They're looking at, around at the attorney generals that don't push justice and we're worried and we're nervous and we're anxious and we're upset but father give us comfort today knowing that the one place where justice is is everlasting father help us not to live for now help us to not stock up here on earth help us not to be stingy with our resources as though this is the only place you lord there, there's a verse there's a verse in proverbs that says that those of us who stock up one day we will die and a fool will take our money. Father, help us to be able to be generous toward the things of you because we are, we, we are showing you by our finances and by our thought process and by our lack of, uh, of anxiety and looking around this world, we're showing you that we have full hope in Revelation 4. So Father, I, I don't know how many years you'll give us I do pray that you would give us a long life so that we can make real impact. But Father, even if you gave us 150 years, that is so small in comparison to eternity with you. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, that today as we end our time, I pray that someone would be full of joy knowing that they have a hope that is beyond the grave. A hope that one day we will be with you. This is not a fantasy. This is a reality. This is a real place. So would you secure that in our heart today? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Man, I pray that you guys are encouraged as we go through the rest of this week. Pray that you would think on Revelation 4. I pray that you would remember that there is that place that is actually a place right now in heaven that one day you will get to experience. Pray that that would encourage you. Hey, for those of you who are coming to the park, I cannot wait to see y'all. We will be starting at 2 p.m. It's going to be a time of fellowship. It's going to be a time of, of worship. We will have worship there. I'm going to be talking just a little bit, but mostly we're just going to be hanging out and seeing each other. So I'm excited to see y'all. Why don't you guys receive, receive this doxology or benediction that's given to the Lord. Now unto him who is able to protect, protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority 
before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, I love y'all. Y'all be good. Y'all be safe. Talk to you soon.